So I'll never read anything by this author again. This is bringing me to my next point. I don't recommend you read this book. Well, that got real dark real quick. I don't understand. So that annoyed the piss out of me. Today we're chatting about another miss from Book of the Month. Book of the Month has just really not been it lately. I'm very worried about next month when I knowingly ordered a Peter Pan retelling, which is again, something that I know I very often do not like uh, because I love Peter Pan. Don't get me wrong, Peter Pan obsessed. It is very rare that I read a retelling that I feel like either does something interesting enough to where if you've like messed with Peter Pan, I'll be like, that's fine because you did something interesting or is a true enough to Peter Pan where I feel like they really get it. You know, they really get the vibe, they get the message, they get what Jan Barry was doing and have like reverently fucked with it. Anyway, that's, maybe it'll surprise me. I'm really hoping it will because I cannot resist a Peter Pan retelling. That's not something that I'm capable of, but I nine times out of 10 hate them. So like, I will be unsurprised. It will not really be Book of the Month Club's fault if I don't like it. It'll be mine for knowingly choosing that book. But anyway, we're here to talk about Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmu. Garmus? Garmu. I still don't know how to pronounce it and I will never learn. So I'll never read anything by this author again. <laughs> Side note about this book that's kind of funny to me. I guess this will become funny to you by the end of this video if you know nothing about this book. But there's in the audiobook, there's an interview with the author at the end. And like one of the first questions that the interviewer asks the author is like, tell me about all the reasons research you did in order to like make this feel so authentic. The research you did to about the time period or about the science or about whatever. And I literally burst out laughing because I was like, she clearly did zero research. Her research is, I feel like this is what that would be <laughs> anyway. So yeah, similarly to cartographers, this will be a spoilery review, but I don't recommend you read this book. So I recommend you stick around and hear all the reasons why. And then at the end, feel that you dodged a bullet. However, if you do think that you might be interested in this or want to make your own opinion, then don't watch this video because it will have spoilers. So lessons in chemistry, first of all, is mismarketed. It's absolutely 100% mismarketed. I don't I don't think that even people who like this book, which apparently there are many, I don't think even they would disagree with me that it is mismarketed. So, or mar at least mismarketed by Book of the Month. I don't actually know who came up with this like comparison or tagline, if it was just Book of the Month or if like the publishers are doing that or the author. I don't know. This is not really something I can blame the author for as far as I know, because I don't think authors control that. In the pitch for this book, it talks about it being, you know, in the 60s and feminist and that it's like, hilariously laugh out loud funny. And the comp it gives, which I mean, these comps are always kind of suspect, but they should at least kind of give you an idea of like a vibe or a tone or like, if you like this, you might like this. Like if someone says, this is the next Harry Potter, you're like, okay, so it's gonna be like magic, maybe a school setting. So like, you know, you have some idea. The comp it gives for lessons in chemistry is the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I have not actually watched, but I have seen a lot of clips of it. And I know that it has a reputation for being very, very funny because the, I believe Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is about a female stand-up comic in like the 50s or 60s. So it's like feminist, but funny, blah, blah, blah. So like, that's what it is saying this is, you know, it's feminist, but funny in the 50s and 60s. Like, you know, it's not about a stand-up comic. Well, like that's the vibe. So I picked this up thinking it would be a light, fun, humorous, sardonic, feminist bit of reading. You know, it'll be a bit serious, a bit funny, you know, but that's what I would be getting out of this. And trigger warnings abound. And I don't think that a book that comps itself, I don't think that a book that calls itself like hilariously funny and a delight and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel in book form, like I don't think that that sets you up with the expectation that there's going to be not one, but two on page in this book. One of them happens very early on in the book. So again, like trigger warning, if you are thinking of picking this up, uh, there are again, not one, but two on page. So I was reading that and I was like, well, that got real dark real quick, but I don't think this is an amazing book. That's just like way darker than the pitch. Like I also don't think it's a very good book, but it is, again, I think people who do like this book would agree with me that this book is a lot darker and a lot more serious than the like, the marketing for it would lead you to believe. Okay, so this book, what is it about? It takes place in the uh, 60s. Uh, there's kind of two timelines-ish. It's kind of wibbly wobbly on the timing because um, we kind of start out in the present where the main main chemist character it has a child and that child is a prodigy and we hear about like her reading, you know, at a college level, basically at the age of five and how she like hides her, her like the notes that her mom writes for her school lunches because like she's embarrassed that she has, like her reading ability is not much better than the kids. So she like hides it and pretends to be illiterate. And then we kind of like jump back and kind of see 
how mom originally met dad and how they got to know each other and then how she ended up getting pregnant and having the daughter and like how her life has kind of like gone from there and then we do basically like catch up to the present um but if memory serves we did jump back and forth a little bit even before we caught up to the present which was like I might not I might not be sure about that. I think I just like the flashback wasn't so clearly to me a flashback when it happened like I didn't it didn't feel like here's the present now we're gonna catch up to it it felt a little more disjointed than that but regardless like we go back we see her early life as a as a young student who's studying chemistry trying to become a chemist I didn't mean to use air quotes she is trying to be a chemist like this isn't like a cartographer situation like as far as I can tell the word chemist is being used appropriately she's studying chemistry at UCLA and working towards getting a doctorate in chemistry she doesn't get a doctorate because of sexism. From the get-go, every single conversation these people are having, every single thing that the author is telling you is pretty on the nose and blunt and soapboxy. And those are like things that I hate. And it doesn't matter to me if I agree with you or not. Like it will irritate me more if I disagree with you. But even if it's like a point that I entirely agree with, even if it's a political position that I entirely agree with, I really don't want a book to be like, you know, like if, if, if I wanted to read a book that's like telling me political philosophy, then I would go read a book that's on political philosophy. You know what I mean? Like, like to be that direct about what you're saying, um, that to be that clear that you are have an agenda and a message, as opposed to just telling a story in which like, because people who say that, you know, books shouldn't have politics in them, I again disagree. Books are inherently political. You are taking a position, no matter what you write, what, no matter if you meant to or not. The way you portray characters, the way you portray what is right and wrong, you are taking a, a stand for Basically, like you are, you are taking a position when you write something that is inescapable. So that's why I don't feel that it's necessary to like yell at the reader or to like be like, did you catch it? My message in this book, like literally every page it's doing that. Like the narrator, when it's telling, when the narrator is telling you the story, it's soapboxing at you. When the characters are having a conversation, they're soapboxing at each other. They're grandstanding about social issues at each other. And it's just constant. And it's it's annoying to me because again, I don't like to be preached at by a book, but it's also unbelievable. So it, it makes it impossible for me to now believe that these are human characters that I'm, who have lives and have thoughts and personalities that I'm following because they don't behave like people. They behave like plot devices inserted for the purpose of yelling at me about a political position or a social position or whatever it may be. And so it's twofold. You know, I'm irritated that you're doing this and it makes it impossible to follow a story because they don't behave like people. So anyway, um, because of sexism, she is not able to pursue a doctorate because, not just sexism, because of sexual assault. Because she gets kicked out of the program because she does not, um, kowtow to um the advances of her like advisor professor I don't I mean I don't really know how it worked or works especially not in sciences so basically you know someone who has power over academia in this school in this environment in this program in this discipline you know she's like in the and of course the reason that she's there late at night in the lab or in the I think it's the lab because like she's a genius and so she's spotted something wrong with like the I don't know what it is they're working on but some like group thing that like you know the advisor person professor person has also put his name to and she's identified a problem with it or like an inconsistency with it or something like that and so she's like there um trying to like fix it the day before they're presenting it something like that and so then he shows up and he like makes moves on her and she's like not obviously into it but even even so, this scene, you know, you can never say that nothing would that something would like that this literally would never happen like this. You know, you can't say that because anything's possible. But it just doesn't read like a natural escalation of events. You know what I mean? Like it reads like, and now he's gonna assault her. You know what I mean? Like it, it just kind of comes out of nowhere, and it doesn't really like the the way that they're behaving in the scene. It doesn't. I mean, it's awful because of what it is, but it doesn't feel like like real. And I don't I mean that feels awful to say that, but like, it doesn't read like a scene where like this is actually how that would go down, how the what they would say, how they would behave. And again, I'm not saying that like it's impossible for somebody to just like walk up and start <laughs> you. Like, I mean, sure, but it just you know what I mean. Like, it, it is it reads like a scene where like the author was like, and here it's gonna be this like aggressive, horrible, <laughs> and it's just like stuck in there in a way that like doesn't feel. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel authentically written, like how the characters actually behave, which is like a big problem in this book in general. Because this is like this is the beginning of a trend that you will observe if you read this book, 
that every single man, every single human born with a Y chromosome in this book is at best a misogynist and at worst a And I just, like, yes, there is sexism in the world. Yes, there is patriarchy in the world, particularly in an earlier time period. You know, we've like slowly made strides. So the further back you go, the worse it is. But I'm sorry, but it's not every man, every, it's not every single man walking around insulting and objectifying and belittling and you know it, it's constant and it's on the nose and it's I'm so, sexism is a lot subtler and more insidious than this if you think like this is why people go around saying well sexism is solved there's no such thing as sexism anymore because like it's illegal you know to do sexist things it's illegal to rape somebody um and that's the thing I mean it's not because like, sexism rarely takes the form of, you are a woman, and therefore you are stupid. Like, that's just, it doesn't work like that. People aren't like that. That's almost never what sexism was. I mean, I'm not saying again that no one in the history of ever has ever said, you are a woman, and therefore you are stupid. But you know what I mean? Like, that's not really the problem with sexism. If it was that easily identifiable, we wouldn't have as big a problem with it as we do. Well, I mean, okay, we would have a problem with it, but we wouldn't have, it wouldn't be so hard to eradicate or identify or put a stop to, because it would be so obvious that, like, you just said you are a woman and therefore you are stupid. Like, this is sexism. You know, it's not that clear cut, usually. So every man behaving this way, again, like, at worst, we get two that, uh, that do essays and um, the rest, except for one, the re and even him a little bit, are, you know, sexist and misogynist. So anyway, you know, shortly, so she stabs the professor with a pencil. Um, she grabs a pencil off the desk and, like, stabs him with it as he's, you know, as this is going on. So when the police come, again, I'm not saying that the police get things right. I'm not saying that the police treat everybody equal. I am not saying that. But again, it feels like this cartoonish depiction of the police don't believe women. Yes, this is a big problem. The police don't believe women. That's why we have kits that go untested. That's why we get, you know, things like this that go unreported. Like, we have a big problem with that. But again, it's literally this, this cop shows up and he's like, so you're, you're like, you want to make an, a statement for like, you want to apologize for the fact that you have, you know, done this to a professor that you have violently assaulted him. And she's like, no, 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 no. Like he was assaulting me and I was protecting myself. And the cop literally will not write anything down, will not take her statement, ignores her, like glares at her until she's like, yes, I want to make a statement. And he's like, good. I'm glad you're like, want to apologize. And it's like, you know what I mean? Like, I just find it very difficult to believe that the cop wouldn't be like, oh, is that right? You said this, like, you know, you're saying that he attacked you. Um, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll look into it. And then maybe they don't look into it. You know, that's a much bigger problem that they're like, sure, 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 sure. And then they do nothing about it. So like the fact that literally in front of her, um, they're like, literally nothing happened. You're the, you know, you're the one that attacked him. You know, like it just doesn't read true. It doesn't read like people actually behaving in this situation would. Again, I'm not saying that the system is great. I'm not saying the cop would believe her. I'm not saying that the cop would immediately investigate and say that the professor was in the wrong and she was in the right. I'm not saying any of that. But the way that in this scene, the cop is like, you know, you're an evil woman who stabbed him with a pencil. Are you ready to apologize? And she's like, no, I was defending myself. And they're like, nope, we will not listen to this or believe this because you were a woman and you are wrong. Like, you know, it's just so like, People don't act like this. <laughs> they just don't. And so then again, look, so we move forward. So she can't get her PhD because this happens. She gets kicked out of school because of this. Um, and so then she's like in this, uh, she's working in a lab. And that's where we meet, you know, Mr. Wright, who ends up being the father of her child. And he's sexist the first time that she meets him. She goes into his lab because she needs supplies. And he tells her to get out because he assumes that she's a secretary. And she doesn't correct him. But she just like takes what she needs and leaves. And then later he finds out that she was a chemist, that she's actually a chemist and he apologizes for having made that assumption. But then she gets in trouble with her department anyway because she took supplies from him and he's like a famous chemist. And they're like, you're causing problems for us by taking these supplies. She's like, look, I ordered supplies and no one will, or like I put in a request for supplies and no one will order them for me. So I had to go get them from him. And they're like, you're causing problems. So she like basically gets kicked out of there too. So then the famous chemist guy has to step in and she'd be like, I don't want help. I don't want handouts. I don't want you using your manpower to, you know, help me as a female in this field. And when they're having like a 
conversation that's like not I don't think it's a date yet but they are like having their first like proper conversation and she literally they their first conversation I mean technically their first conversation was him assuming she was a secretary but like their full their first proper conversation I'm not kidding she's literally just like grandstanding and soapboxing at him about the inherent sexism in the system about patriarchy about how he's benefited from this privilege and she has not and doesn't he see that this is a system from which he benefits and I'm just like the way that she's like fully formed the thesis of this argument and is like spewing it at him and the way he's like oh I never considered how much I, I guess I benefit from this and then there's like I guess it's like a cute rom-com thing but it's uh, it, it's weird and I don't like it we get both of their perspectives when they they are not yet dating but they are seeing each other in the office like you know interacting and like working on stuff together and because you know she literally like <laughs> Um, gave him a speech on sexism, then in his mind, he's like, I'm tr treating her the way that she wants. I will not carry anything for her. I will not open a door for her. I will, like, she looks like she really cannot handle this level of books, like she's about to fall over, um, but I will not offer to carry them for her because that's sexist. And he's like, but you know, like I'm really interested in her, but she does not seem interested in me at all. And then we get her perspective and she's like, I can't believe like he wouldn't even help me when I was carrying these books. Like he must really not care about me at all. Um, he won't like help me at all. And then like she like makes some, she like talks to him about the behavior of silkworms and something about like their chemistry. And she's like, are you not interested in this at all? He's like, no, I'm not interested in this at all. And she's like, he hates me because like, when he's responding to this, he d he's just talking about the science. And she thought this was like an overture of like, like a romantic overture. She was hinting at him something about, it's something to do with like mating of silkworms or something like that. So she, that was like her being like, you know, mating, uh, something like that. Um, it was not like super, I would, all, I mean, I'm not a scientist. So like, I also would have been like, didn't understand that. So she's like, he won't help carry my books. And he said, he's not interested in this like science thing which means he's not interested in me and like she's written kind of she's like kind of coded to be possibly on the spectrum which is also annoying to me because like this book is doing that thing of like quirky science girl who's not like other girls who might be on the spectrum and then like constantly is rude to people because she's possibly on the spectrum and like so like the rudeness takes on like two there's like two versions of the rudeness that often overlap where she just yells at people about the inherent injustice of the sexist system which like on a first conversation is like wow okay <laughs> we're opening with that awesome um and then she she kind of does the like if you've ever watched bones um the the show with emily de chanel where she plays dr temperance brennan who's a forensic anthropologist and like in that show it's kind of like played for laughs that she answers everything like you know it's kind of like a or i guess uh, people do this with like with like spock or things like that where you just like literally like the angel in uh, Supernatural where they just like literally answer a question and like don't get social cues. Um, so like if someone's like making, you know, a double entendre or someone is like using slang, she'll just like answer as if she's take, meaning, taking it literally um, because, you know, science brain possibly on the spectrum. So like the main character, like... It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I'm not an expert on how any of this works. I'm not a psychology expert, but the way that she like understands the nuances and subtleties of how she is being mistreated by the system as a female, but then doesn't understand nuances and subtleties of human interaction because she's like a quirky science girl who answers literally. Like, I don't think you can like have your cake and eat it too. Like it can't be both. And the, and uh, going to her awareness of the world and perception of the world, as I mentioned, literally every man in this in this alternate universe is at best a misogynist and at worst a <laughs> So the fact that every single time she encounters and makes the acquaintance of a new male person, that she is surprised that they are treating her differently because she's a woman. And she answers them as if it doesn't enter her mind that they would think of her differently. Like when they say something about her wearing pants, it's not played as if she's like, I'll pretend like I don't understand what they mean because like why shouldn't I wear pants? She's like literally like, yes, I think pants are very comfortable. Thank you for noticing or something like that. And you're like, you can't. She's constantly yelling about how women are treated differently and talked to differently. And she's, in her experience in this book, every single man is like this. So when she cannot possibly su be surprised when she does realize she's being mistreated as a woman. I'm like, I don't know why you're acting like this has never happened to you before when it happens on every page. Like in this world, you should have expected it because every single man in this world is a monster. So I don't know why you're surprised. And two, you can't both be hyper aware of how you're being mistreated and also completely unaware of it because you're like, 
quirky science girl. Like it, you can't be both. And this is why she doesn't read like a, a character. She reads like an author insert or a, you know, not even author insert. Cause like that would be acting like the author. I don't think the author acts like this. She's just like a device that in this scene, we need to play for laughs that she doesn't understand what's happening because she's quirky science girl. So that's how I'm writing her in this scene. But in the next scene, I want to make a point about sexism. So here she's hyper aware that sexism is happening. So she's going to like comment on it and yell about it because in this instance, she gets it because I need her to. But over here she doesn't because it's funny that she doesn't. So like, that's not a human person, like the way you're writing her. She's just like, whatever you need her to be in a scene, that doesn't work for me. And then again, like how every single instance, so what happens in this book, right, is so like she gets kicked out of science programs and then when she gets pregnant, because you know, Mr. Wright, who is like a little bit sexist, but like, you know, is the good kind of sexist. Like they have this whole conversation about like her not wanting to change, uh, that they had agreed that if she, they were together, she didn't want to get married and didn't want to change her name because, you know, professional whateverness. And like, I shouldn't have to take a husband's name. Would you take my name? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and so then the thing of him agreeing to this, but then later being like, well, I just kind of thought you'd change your mind. So it's like written as if he's kind of, it was so confusing to me, like emotionally as a reader, because we have this whole, like multiple instances of him, like really not getting it. Of like her being like, I thought we agreed that like, you know, as a independent female, I don't want to have to do this. Or I don't want to, you know, it's not fair to me. And that he's agreed to these things. And then later been like, well, but I just thought, you know, that like in the end you would agree to this and in the end you would marry me and in the end you would take my name and you would have my children. And like all of that, it seems to me, it seemed to me as the reader that like, because we know in the present day, she is a single mom. We know that she has this prodigy child and that he's not in the picture. So I was like, okay, this is building up to like why it really ultimately didn't work out between them. Why ultimately they broke up because it turns out like he seemed like he maybe was like the one man out of literally every single man in this world who gets it. And then it turns out even he doesn't get it. So then like they're going to break up. Um, except no, he tragically dies. Again, I told you spoilers. He tragically dies. And then after he dies is when she finds out that she's pregnant. And the way she thinks of him is that like he was her one true love and they were totally compatible and perfect together. And there will never ever be anyone else for her because he was like her one and only, like they just connected on a soul level. He was perfect. And I was like, he... But he wasn't though, like you, and it wasn't painted as one of those like interesting character studies where like sometimes we romanticize relationships that end early. Like, you know, we have actors that died young, like James Dean and they'll forever be this like person who died young and that there's a certain like aura about that. It's not written like that where she's like romanticizing him because she's thinking of everything that never could be and that probably wouldn't be as good as she's imagining it because it never came to be kind of thing. No, it's just like, he was perfect. And it's so sad that he's dead because he was literally perfect. And I was like, but he wasn't like, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. And then her daughter who is like, you know, even more of a prodigy than either of her, of her parents. I have a huge problem with how this is depicted because again, the kid is just like her mom. Like she does, she gets the social cues of like, it's awkward at school because I'm smarter than everybody else. So I'm going to pretend to be dumb. I'm going to pretend that I can't read as well as they can because it's awkward that I can read novels and they're learning the alphabet. But she doesn't get social cues other times where she's like talking with adults and she like doesn't understand like like she act you know she kind of like her mom where she like doesn't answer questions like in a way that she would think and like it's just it doesn't she doesn't act like a, a character and also 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 they, they keep it's like a comedic beat where like every so often like the little kid pops up and she's like entering a room and she's like reading the sound and the fury or Dostoevsky or something like that and she's like five or six or something like that and I'm like I, I will buy that she can read like complicated words and complicated sentences and has achieved that level of like technical skill at such a young age. But the reason that you don't give, the reason we have middle grade books that are different from adult books is, I mean, it's partly to do with the difficulty level of the, the prose itself, but it's more to do with the, the subject matter being something that a young person can relate to, can understand, has experienced, is like, in that sense on their level. Even like high schoolers, like I, a lot of the books that we make high schoolers read, they're not really something that a high school age kid can most of the time identify with, which is why it's kind of a bad idea to make people at that age read it because we're not talking about reading comprehension. Like you can read the sentence and understand it. And if you're telling me this five-year-old can read the sentence and understand what these words mean, I mean, sure, she's a prodigy, she can do that. But she's not emotionally mature enough to handle these themes. She's not emotionally developed enough to understand what's going on. And she's not even cognitively developed enough to understand this. And even if she can understand it, she can't relate to it. Like, what does this mean to her? Like if it's a, a book written by and for, you know, 40 year olds who have lived and loved and lost and experienced, you know, 
midlife crises and experienced financial hardship and have etc 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 you know have been married have had kids understand what it's like to experience and feel those things like even if this five-year-old can't understand these sentences she would not be able to relate on any level to what's going on or to the experience being depicted so i guess it's funny that she walks in the room reading these books and it's like because she's so smart <laughs> but like it doesn't make sense like she wouldn't be interested in this for those reasons not because she doesn't understand the, the words but because the you know what I'm saying? And it's stuff like this that's constantly like, this is just like not how people behave. Like people are not like this. I can't buy this story. And like, it's not like a, if it was like a straight up comedy book where like, we're not really taking anything seriously. And it's like, you know, it's kind of like something from like the Big Bang Theory, which is a show that I hate. Like if a kid walks on, you know, like if you have like five-year-old Sheldon reading Dostoevsky, you'd be like, ha ha ha, because he's a genius. But like, this isn't a serious thing we're doing here. These aren't meant to be characters that we like are really serious about. So that annoyed the piss out of me. So anyway, I was trying to say, so where this goes is she gets fired because she's pregnant. Um, so, and you can't have a pregnant woman in the workplace. And again, this is where she doesn't behave like somebody in the time period because she's shocked that she's pregnant. But then when she learns that she's pregnant and like she's being ousted from the office for this reason, then she like yells at her boss and is like, well, would you fire, uh, you know, because he's dead now, you know, her, Mr. Wright. So she's like, if he was here, would you fire him? And they're like, well, no, of course we wouldn't. And she's like, but he helped make the baby. It's not fair. Like we are, we're both, you know, we both participated in the making of this baby. Why am I getting fired and not him? Which like is, of course, like an argument that has been made many a time. Like, why are women punished for this when men participated in it as well? This is the 1950s and 60s. And she's like working in a, like every single man that she's encountered in this world has been a horrible misogynist. So the fact that she's acting genuinely surprised, like if she would later, like if she had said these exact same things, it would have been a little bit on the nose, but if she had been, you know, like hanging out with her friend or her mom or whoever later and was like, it's just so unfair. Cause you know, like they would never do it to him, but they're doing it to me. And you'd be like, yeah, that's how the world is. And it's, it's really shit. Um, then I'd be like, yeah, like, okay, that's a conversation you might have. But the fact that she's like genuinely surprised that this is happening to her when like, I don't know how she, I mean, even today it happens and this is the sixties. Um, and then the fact that she like literally talks back at her boss like that and is like, but you wouldn't do that to him, would you? Well, then why are you doing it to me? It's just like, I just don't believe that this conversation would happen. I don't believe that she'd be surprised and I don't believe that she would say these things. Like, and if she is that unaware of how things work, then she wouldn't have the awareness to form these ideas about how sexist things are because she seems to be unaware of it for that scene and is surprised that it's happening to her. You know what I mean? So anyway, um, she like builds a chem lab in her own kitchen and she ends up like basically freelancing for the same place that she worked for before because like she's so good at science so they really cannot do their work without her. Like they literally cannot. So then even though she doesn't work there anymore, the like other scientists that worked there, they still come to see her and she still works with them like on a freelance basis. And then because of like a school lunch situation, she ends up meeting the father of a little girl that goes to school with her daughter and he's like a TV producer. And I did not mention that quirky science girl who doesn't understand things is also like drop dead gorgeous. Like everyone was like, damn, she is so beautiful, but she like doesn't know that she's pretty because she's like quirky science girl that doesn't understand social cues. So he sees her and he's like, I want to put you on television. And he happens to have this like afternoon slot that he needs to fill. And I, he wants to do a cooking show for that. And you know, cause the whole lunch school lunch situation is to do with like these basically like gourmet lunches that she was packing for her daughter that like his daughter was then eating. And so he's like, you know, clearly you can cook and you're like gorgeous. So like, I want to put you on my show. But then she ends up when she's on the show. And again, the way she behaves, <sighs> this makes me so, this book made me so angry. They just like would never put her on TV. She's such a problem from the very beginning. She doesn't have a show yet that is popular, but she's making demands about how the show's going to go. She won't follow the script. She won't say what they want her to say. She won't wear what they want her to wear. She hates everything about it. It's like, it has to be her way or no way. And the guy who wanted to hire her is like, okay, like, I mean, I get it, but like, you kind of have to just do stuff because like, that's how the studio wants it. And you just kind of have to do it. And she's like, no, I refuse. And somehow she ends up with a show that is really successful because like on the show, instead of like just being personable and chatting or whatever, she like gives the science behind cooking, which like in theory, like that's like a cool little concept for a show. And I think it'd be more popular now than it would be in the sixties. But like the whole idea is that she's not talking down to housewives that like her entire show is an opportunity to soapbox at the audience where she's like, you know, like the women who like come to the tapings, you know, they're like, I'm just a silly housewife. I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, 
you're not a silly housewife. You're a smart, intelligent woman who basically has her own job because you have to cook and you have to clean and you have to blah, 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 blah. And like, that's really difficult. And like, tell me what you studied. And like, oh, you wanted to be a surgeon? Well, you still could be. This isn't just because it's, you know, it shouldn't be a man's world. You can do whatever you want to do. And it's just like, oh, wow, like she's not talking down to us. And then like her entire show is like, instead of saying, you know, you add the vinegar to the mustard and you put it on the salad, she's like, here's the chemical composition of this. And this is why, you know, on a chemical level, this is how these two things interact. And that's why it produces this effect in your food. And that's what we're looking for. And that's why we combine these ingredients. But she like, explains it in like a science professor kind of way. And the book is trying to convince us that this is relatable and this makes the housewives feel like they're being talked to like intelligent human beings and that that's why they love this show and that they're learning so much science from it. And I'm like, no, that would be extremely alienating because like they talk about how they get phone calls from housewives into the studio who are wanting to know because she doesn't refer to anything by its common name. Like she won't say vinegar. She'll say whatever like the chemical name is for like what that is. And so instead of it being like a show that everyone's like, the fuck is this? I'm not watching it. They call the studio to be like, we're buying ingredients for the recipe and we don't know what that is because she used a science name for it. And so they all have to tell every housewife that calls. And I'm like that, I find it very difficult to believe that the show would be successful for that very reason. And then she like announces on television that she's an atheist, which is bringing me to my next point is that this book about a quirky science girl is virulently anti-religion. And I don't just mean like this character happens to be an atheist and that's a part of her character, which like, that's fine. If your character is an atheist, you can tell me that they're an atheist and they can be atheist. But as much as it's soapboxes about feminism and about how wrong that is, it's constantly talking about how religion is awful and how, you know, every priest is a pedophile and how religion is like the way that stupid people explain the world to themselves because they don't know science. And I just, it's so rude. I don't understand why this book had to go so hard at, 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 at religion. And, and, and again, it feels like it has an agenda. Like again, if this, if this main character, she personally was like, I don't get religion. Like I have science brain and I can only function in terms of like, you show me the thing, I see the proof of it. Faith does not come into it. Like that's how I function. Like if that's how she was, I'd be like, that makes sense. But there's multiple, so her, Mr. Wright before he died makes an extremely anti-religion like little soapboxing moment for him as well. And she on television in her show, when someone asks her, it's like, uh, you know, we love your show. We were wondering, you know, like, uh, what grace you say, like before you have your delicious meals, we would like to know or something like that, which already feels a little bit like, would they ask that? Like, I guess maybe. And then she's like, oh yeah, I'm an atheist. Tra -la -la. And like the studio goes crazy um, because she's just said that on television. And she's like, what? I, what's the problem? But of course this doesn't really hurt her popularity. It results in some like slandering of her in a newspaper. But just like, even nowadays, people are kind of like iffy around like talking about that kind of thing on TV. In the 60s, a show for housewives that's for cooking and the the, sh the host of the show is like, yeah, I'm an atheist. Like I just, and this does not hurt her popularity with those housewives. I'm just like, I don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And I also don't understand why this has to be such a big deal for this book that like this character is like extremely anti-religious. It's, it's so annoying to me. So anyway, there's like this this B plot about like the orphanage where Mr. Wright grew up and how he's actually the child of this other person and how like they were lied to and there was money involved. And then like, because he's dead now, then like those people end up finding her and like the daughter that he didn't know he was gonna have after he died. And they all like reconnect and everything and all, isn't that nice? And it's yet another opportunity for her to bond with his mother because his mother, you know, had to hide behind the name of a man to make arrangements. And she basically runs a company. Uh, de facto runs a company, but like there's technically a man in charge because like, you know, a woman can't run this company, but she basically runs everything in his name. And so we have another conversation about, you know, men suck and the world is awful to women. And I'm like, yeah, no, I got that that was your message. <laughs> it's, it's very, very clear. Don't worry. And yeah, it's just the whole book is like that and it's awful and I hate it. I really, really, really hate it because it's not a story. It's not a story. I just, oh, and then as to like inaccuracies, uh, the other stuff you could be like, well, how do you know? Maybe people did talk like this in the 60s. I mean, I don't think so, but 
okay, maybe she did, maybe she did. But there's a part where literally like in order to make a feminist point, and this is when she, I don't think she said this out loud. I think she just thinks it to herself about how like, well, in Sweden, they have like uh, thus and such built in, you know, government funded childcare, uh, like maternity and childcare. And um, based on when this is supposed to be taking place, that would not be true in Sweden for another like 20 years, I think 15 or 20 years. So basically like it's unlikely, even if Sweden did have like such a policy, it seems very unlikely to me that like, Miss Chemistry Science Brain in America in the 60s would be that aware of like Swedish government programs and policies. But let's say that she is, let's say she really truly is, that wasn't a thing in Sweden. So even if she is that aware of like the governments of other countries and their social policies, that wasn't a thing in Sweden. So it's only put in this book because the modern day author thought that the modern day audience like would be like, oh yeah, that's right. Those great socialist Scandinavian countries that have all of those amazing government benefits. We should be like that. This isn't fair. But in the 60s, that was not true, even in Sweden. So this is why, I mean, in addition to the other things that I feel like I cannot so easily fact check, but the other stuff where I'm like this, I, I don't think this is how things were ever. But okay, but that one you can fact check. And you're like, that's, that wasn't a thing. You only put that in because you wanted to make that point. Which is why, again, the author interview at the end of the audiobook, when she's like, tell me about all the research you did to make this feel so real and authentic and about the time period. And I was like, well, she didn't research when Sweden decided to institute that policy. So that wasn't part of it. And the last thing I want to mention, just because it's bizarre, is that one of the perspectives in this book is her dog and it does not work. It does not work. It's it's in theory something that's like kind of quirky and fun and could be used to great effect. But it doesn't it doesn't work. Just the same as she doesn't know how to write people, she doesn't know how to write a dog. And like I truly cannot tell you how the mind of a dog works, but like when I read Robin Hobb and she's telling me the thoughts of a dog that, you know, is wit bonded with a main character, I'm like, yeah, that checks out. That seems like what a dog would think. That seems like dog logic to me. There's a thriller horror book that I read last year um, that has a cat perspective. The, I think The Last House on Needless Street, um, I think is what it was called. And the cat perspective absolutely worked. But the dog perspective here, it feels like this bizarre quirky choice that even the name of the dog is quirky because uh, it's a, a dog that like follows them home one day and they name it 630 and it's like an ex-military dog that like the dog didn't like the all the bomb because he was supposed to be like a bomb sniffing dog and he like didn't like all the explosions he like gives him anxiety so then he ended up being like kicked out of that program because it's like his own little like social justice narrative about how like his you know uh his anxiety issues you know are not being addressed by the system so he uh, is extreme. He's about. He's a dog prodigy, basically. She's like teaching him words, and like you know, dogs are supposed to only know, be able to know like a hundred words, and he knows like four thousand or something ridiculous. And there's like multiple comedic beats where like the fact that his name is six thirty is one of those like who's on first type moments, and it's just like uh -huh, okay, that's great. And it just like I don't understand why this was in here. Like it doesn't really add anything to the story. There's a there's a couple times where like I mean I have to say like of the of the things we got in this book, the parts that I maybe related to the most or found the most um, compelling were actually the dog parts, but like, I don't think it was good. Like, I don't think this like worked. I don't think it was a good choice. I don't think this is actually like a well done dog perspective, but like, yeah, I liked it better than everything else, which that should tell you all you need to know about this book. And in case um, you were wondering where the section, where the second section occurs, it's in the TV um, studio, like the big exec who's like been hating on her show because she doesn't do what he wants her to do. He, she, he has to see her and it happens. It's like a Harvey Weinstein, basically like me too type thing where like she gets almost in his office and then he gets fired and they find out that actually, even though he keeps saying that the show is terrible and they need to do what he says, the show has been getting amazing ratings and amazing reviews and every sponsor in the world wants to work with it, which is again, why it just like beggars belief that an exec who's main, who's like has an extremely successful show would be like, but I hate this woman who won't do exactly what I say. Therefore, I'm gonna tank this really successful show because I'm an evil man that hates women. Like, I'm not saying that that's impossible. I'm not saying that that would never happen, but it seems extremely unlikely that like this, the profit motive wouldn't outweigh the like, I wanna control every woman in my life because I'm an evil man motive. So again, I was just like, like, I, I just saw it coming. like. I was like, there's, he keeps saying the show's not doing well, but like they, we keep getting calls in the studio, but like all these women wanting to make these recipes, but he's saying the show's not doing well. And then as soon as they like find his files and they're like, how could the show's been doing great? I'm just like, I'm so surprised. <laughs> so any who's I do not recommend lessons in chemistry. Um, 
absolutely not. This is like almost everything that I hate in a book. There's, you know, there's a few things that I hate in books that's not in here. Mainly to do with the fact that this is not speculative. Well, I would argue that it is speculative fiction because this is an entirely alternate universe because none of this is actually how the world is. You know, it's not fantasy, it's not sci-fi. So I can't do things that I hate when it comes to those kinds of things. But otherwise, kind of everything that I hate, including using the word nonplussed incorrectly. When I did that, I was like, of course, of course you don't know the correct usage of nonplussed. Why would I expect better? So yeah, zero out of 10 to not recommend. If you have read it, let me know your thoughts. If you have not read it, uh, let me know your thoughts. Whatever you let me know. I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye.